Hello and welcome to the Matt to Mastery podcast where we bring some inspirational leaders on how they were able to accomplish their mastery from Matt to Mastery. So we're bringing in leaders from all across, across the globe who have obtained their black belt and here to hear their interesting insights on how they were able to how, how they were able to apply those amazing insights into the, the on, not only onto the mats, but off the mats. And today I have a very special guest all the way from the UK. And it brings me so much pleasure. Chris Ong, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for being here today. Welcome to the Mat to Mastery podcast. Hi, Sheb. And um, yeah, thank you so much for Given the opportunity to speak on uh, your Mat to Mastery uh, podcast, um, so yeah, I really appreciate it, especially with the time difference as well. I'm in the UK and uh, it's, it's almost late at night where you are at the moment in Australia. Oh, it's not that late. It's only seven, seven, ten past seven. <laughs> all good. Oh, this is the time that life starts here on the Gold Coast. Uh, yeah, true. Too hot in the in the mornings, as I understand. Yeah. 100%. Chris, for those of us who haven't had the honour of meeting you, could you give us a little brief about who you are, where you're from, and a little bit of background on uh, your experience with martial arts? Yeah, sure. So, yeah, I'm Chris Song. Um, in terms of, like, my profession at the moment, so I'd say that uh, I'm a mental fitness coach. Uh, my niche at the moment is kind of um, consumer good sales professionals because I had a 15 year career um, as an account manager in the consumer goods industry. But yeah, I've been doing jujitsu for it will be 18 years next month. Uh, so seems like, yeah, a very, very long time, but that's flown by. Um, I'm a second degree uh, black belt um, and like under uh, an instructor, um, Andy Roberts, who is who got his black belt from Roger Gracie. So I fall under that Roger Gracie um, Academy umbrella, so to speak. Um, and yeah, like in terms of, in terms of like, I guess that's, that's kind of my profession. It, what I also do, um, a lot of my time at the moment is spent, uh, not just training jujitsu, but I am probably teaching jujitsu classes, I would say three to four times a week, um, at the moment, depending on the week. Um, but yeah, that's kind of, um, part of my profession as well. So yeah, that's kind of a, me in a nutshell at the moment. I love it. So 2006 was when you, you started training in jiu-jitsu. Yeah. What inspired you to start? Um, oh, sorry. I should just mention, actually, some people may know me. I have an Instagram profile. I just totally forgot about that um, on the 84 where I draw cartoons. But we, we'll come pick up on that um, in a little bit. But, yeah, 2006, what encouraged me to start? So at the time I was at university um, in Sheffield, which is – kind of um, further north in England, um, studying for a law degree. And I will say that around 2004, 2005, um, MMA started to pique my interest as a spectator sport. So I've always been interested in sport. I would say up until that point, mainly football, we call it over here, but I, I suppose like, you know, soccer for many other people, uh, different countries, but always been into sport. And um, when I, as I was growing up, my, my dad was very much into me doing some form, some, some form of martial arts. So I did sort of six, seven years of karate when I was much younger um, and I'd always watch boxing. But I really started getting interested in UFC around 2004, 2005. And you kind of start to dive down rabbit holes as you watch. And, you know, kind of jujitsu was very prominent. I'd never had any experience of any sort of uh, ground or grappling um, ground fighting and so then when i was at university um, i realized that there was a, a club um, a jiu-jitsu club a couple of miles away from me and i decided to uh, take the plunge um, i suppose and start to try start to do a bit of training whilst i was studying uh, for my degree so yeah so essentially that's how i started um, and I, I would say that i didn't my initial training was very sporadic uh, because at university, my priority was obviously studying, but also socializing, <laughs> going out and drinking five days a week. Um, but I, I would say that at that point, I was training maybe once a week, uh, you know, every couple of weeks. And then, you know, the time during kind of exam periods, obviously, I wasn't training at all whilst you're kind of revising that kind of stuff. But I would say that I started to, yeah, really get a, a feel 
of what the sport was all about um, back then. And I think what was interesting for me was that I liked to think of myself as I picked up on things from a sporting point of view fairly quickly, um, whether that was football or um, athletics uh, when I was in, in my youth. Those are kind of main, maybe my, my two main sports. But jujitsu was something completely different. Um, at the time when I started jujitsu, I was mainly just uh, lifting weights um, in the gym multiple times a week. But but I started jujitsu and it was just so unnatural to me. Um, and I, I say that to anybody, really, like, you know, if I if I can get a black belt, anybody can get a black belt because, yeah, I was uh, I was pretty terrible when I started. And that was kind of a shock to me because. I thought, oh, I think this will be something that hopefully I can pick up quite quickly. And I've been watching the UFC, but yeah, it was awful. Um, so, and I think, you know, I think you kind of go two ways, right? Like some people you see start and 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 and, and I think I think most people, it, it shock, it's a shock to the system when they start jiu-jitsu because it's completely unnatural movements. Um, and they go, well, they, they, they start it and they kind of like, I'm going to go the way of, I don't want to do this anymore. Whereas some people kind of think, yeah you know like i i need to get better at that and you know they're, they're a bit more tenacious and i think fortunately for me because you know it's been a remark well it's been an amazing journey um i kind of veered down that path but that was yeah. my start in jiu-jitsu really what was the the most inspiring part of your journey in those early days what inspired you to just keep coming back even though you you found it challenging to begin with do you know what i think so like if i look at me now, <clears throat> uh, I, I, I'm training most days now uh, because, as, as I say, that's part of my job. Uh, so, like, I am. I, if I look at my weight, I'm probably like 71 kilos at the moment. So, like, quite light. At the time, though, because I was lifting weights more regularly, I think when I started jujitsu, I was probably more like 85 kilos. So, quite a lot bigger. And I think what inspired me was just just getting beaten up by smaller people. Um, and I remember at the time. So when I started at the club as well, like, you know, that was really quite early on um, in terms of jujitsu in the UK. So I think in the UK, probably you find that in Australia now, uh, you find like a club on every corner now, you know, there's, there's hundreds of clubs. But at the time in the UK, there, there weren't many at all. And so when I started, um, my instructor, John Goldson, was, I think he was like a blue belt three stripe, right? So he, you know, he was heading up the club. But I remember rolling with a I can't, you know what i can't remember her name uh, a lady she was probably my age or a little bit older than me she was a policewoman actually and she was a blue belt and you know i was significantly bigger than her and uh yeah she would just run rings around me you know and um i think that's kind of what inspired me um to keep coming back really like how do i how do i learn more um how do i how do i level up and i think you know when i when i look back at that time um, and I, I look at kind of the values which are important to me. I think one one of the one of the key values for me is kind of continuous learning, continuous development, and and I think that's what jujitsu provide provided for me back then. Although maybe I didn't connect the dots, um, but certainly something that is really important to me now because I, I think yeah, for me jujitsu is like kind of a, a never ending journey. So I think those mm. are things that really inspired me at that point. Right. I love that how your values at that time in those younger days was to continue c continuous development. So to mm. continue to learn, open to learning. So you've got this growth mindset. And despite, as you put it, you know, you were you were being beaten, but yet you still showed persistence. You still showed that, hey, I'm still keen to learn this. And normally like an, an, an average person would have just got up and said, I'm done, I'm out. <laughs> I'm over this. Yeah. What was the mindset that was going through your mind at the time? Can you recall? You know, I know you said it's the learning, being open to learning. Uh, because I can, you know, there were times when I've thought about mm -hmm. just giving up, throwing the towel in, especially as a female grappler in a yep. male dominant environment. You know, there have been times where I've just been so challenged and triggered where I've thought about just, just walking away. Yeah. Right. So I wonder in your experience, has it been perhaps um, a, a strategy, a, perhaps a coping strategy that you may have utilized or perhaps that you could recommend or offer someone 
who may be considering walking away. Is there something that you can offer perhaps for those people? Absolutely. Um, it's, it's strange. If I, if I go back to the, the, first, the first part of the question, um, when I first started jujitsu, um, you know, like in the UK, like you hardly ever saw anybody who higher than a blue belt, right? And I think that kind of, fra that's your point of um, reference, right? So for me, it was, uh, in the early days, I, I think what drove me was I want to at least get a blue belt. Um, so in my mind, I was kind of like, I get a blue belt. And then, um, you know, at that point, I'd be more focused on my professional career. I mean, you know, back in 2006, I wanted to be a, a commercial or contract solicitor. Um, I changed my mind fa fairly quickly after that. Um, but, you know, no, knowing that industry, they work incredibly long hours. Um, yeah, you know, uh, and, and, and realistically, there wouldn't be much time for jujitsu training. So in my head, I was like, I want to at least get a blue belt. That was kind of driving driving me and, and actually at the start i had some crazy idea that oh you know i I'd, I'd like to at least test myself once um in some sort of mma arena whether that's amateur or semi-professional um but then again I, I i think after starting to get my first few injuries in jiu-jitsu um you know i kind of abandoned that idea um but i, th I think you go back to in terms of strategy um, and the learning, I think where it was actually like a, a couple of years in, um, and I, I got my blue belt and I'd, um, I'd, I'd basically moved from, I graduated from university, moved back home, um, to Essex, uh, which is kind of the Southeast of England. And again, fortunately enough for me, there was a, a club about 20 miles from me. Um, and it was run by a black belt. Uh, the black belt was a guy, uh, Mark Walder, who was actually one of Mauricio Gomez's first three UK black belts in the country. So he got his black belt, I believe, in 2005. So if you think at the time, when I came back then, there were probably only three or four, maybe five English black belts in the country. And I was fortunate enough that one of them was kind of on my doorstep, right? So I graduated from uni, started going there. And that kind of, obviously, there's a, there's a difference. There's a difference between a black belt and a blue belt, right, in terms of technical knowledge. And I, I, I would say that in today's age where information age, where we've got everything available to us on BJJ Fanatics, um, that that gap is a lot smaller now. But back then in 2007, the gap was huge, right? And I think, um, you know, learning with a black belt uh, and, and higher grades in this class, I kind of opened it up my mind to actually there's there's more, there's more, technical knowledge out there and you know they're kind of really um again like accelerated my my desire to learn more and i think as well like meeting i, I say this now like um meeting a guy um, I, I still consider him to be my mentor a guy called uh, craig robertson um you know kind of really inspired me again like somebody who's like he's probably the most natural person i've ever come across uh, in jiu-jitsu so he went from white to purple belt in something like 17 months right which is which is crazy and then and then he blew his knee out and he decided that you know he, he's got a a blue collar job decided he just quit right but his his, his knowledge is is amazing and um and i still kind of would chat to him even now even though he hasn't trained for about 12 years if i to troubleshoot some stuff but but that kind of like accelerated my growth and in terms of the strategy i i would say that the strategy that i employ is is very much not not putting mass a massive amount of pressure on myself right um and i think and, and also not belt chasing i've never apart from yeah i wanted my blue belt but i never put a timeline on that right but i think i talk you know you talk to some students who get frustrated that you know oh you know I, i've set this timeline for myself and i want to be a purple belt i want to be a brown belt by that point and and i just think that takes the enjoyment out of out of your jiu-jitsu i think when you aim for goals like that you you know it's one of the things that, that i i kind of work with clients in mental fitness it, you know you want to be as present as possible and that's what i try and do in my jiu-jitsu right so i'm just mm -hmm. focusing on learning different areas like at the moment i'm really focusing on my guard passing at the moment i'm really focusing on because i'm recovering from a knee injury yeah. and i can't i can't use like half butterfly guard i'm i'm working on other ways to to kind of use half guard so i'm not just getting smashed if somebody passes my open guard, right? Um, so I'm just focusing on that. I'm not focusing on 
and it's easy for me to say because I'm a black belt now, but that's always how I've approached it. And so I feel like I'm um, just being present is key. I think if you you get stressed and you get anxious when you when you think about the future, like I should be a brown belt, I should be a blue belt by this time. And I think it takes a lot of the enjoyment out of it. And also I, I say to people, be careful what you wish for, right? Because um, you might get that blue belt, you might get that purple belt, but then it only adds more pressure. You know, it's kind of the, we tell ourselves like in part of the mental fitness, we, the big lie that we tell ourselves is I will be happy when I'll be happy when I get my blue belt. I'll be happy when I get my purple belt. But then, sorry, that's my dog. But then, but then, you, but then you get there and there's like a whole, you've got a bullseye, you've got a target on your back. There's like a whole new level of pressure because you've got blue belts, you're a purple belt, you've got blue belts, hungry blue belts gunning for you now. And those roles become very different. Uh, and you start putting more and more pressure on yourself. So I think if, if there's a, coping mechanism that that that's been my mind throughout the time like just not putting pressure on myself yeah you know you touched a really important point about um about those the people who will obtain their their belt they'll level up and there's this imposter syndrome that kicks in and i want to talk to you about that and how you would how you would challenge that. But before I do, I would love to ask you if you could go back to your white belt self, what advice would you give yourself? Oh, that's a good question. I, I would give myself the advice, open up my game more. I, and I, I think, I think that when I was a white belt, it was, uh, I was I was stronger then, right? So I think I was kind of uh, more attributes based um, and younger, obviously. And so I think I would, instead of like opening up and trying more things, which is what I do now, because there was a fear, there was a fear of oh, if I get put in a bad position, I'm going to get smashed. Um, I, I kind of shell up more and try to shut things down when I was like kind of sparring with people, even though I had more technical knowledge. And I remember my instructor watching me roll one time. He's like, oh, you got into a, the mount position. Like, why didn't you go for the arm bar? And it was a good question. Like, why didn't I? You know, because I think there was a fear of losing position, just not opening up my game. And I think that very much like stymied my progress um, as a white belt all the way, I would say, up until about a year into blue belt. A year into blue belt was when I started to really open up my game more and, and, and try new things. So that would be my the advice I would give myself as a white belt. I love, that. I love that. Open up your game. I love it. Now coming back to and given that you're, you know, you work with mental well-being, I'd love to know your opinion and your advice on the reason why this happens and how we can break that barrier, how we can overcome that. And perhaps you might give us some tips or some strategies. Why is it that when a person has leveled up, They've obtained the blue belt or purple belt. There's this, there's this imposter syndrome that kicks in. You know, oh, I'm not, yes, but I'm not, I don't feel very worthy of it. What? If, you know, obviously the professor sees something in this person for them to be able to give them that, that belt. So I wonder, have you perhaps yourself experienced this or know of someone who may have experienced this? Why does this happen? And how can we overcome this? Uh, yeah, absolutely. And, um, you know, I, I think it's part of the, I'm going through a, a, a mental fitness coaching certification with positive intelligence at the moment. And and it's interesting. What, what's, what's been a, a key insight to me with regards to imposter syndrome recently is that, yeah, as part of that kind of mental fitness model, the coaching model that I use, there are kind of saboteurs that we have. We all have like, and, and, you know, I won't go into all of them, but like, if you, if you think about my top, my top three saboteurs would be like the controller, the avoider and um, the stickler, right? Um, there are nine saboteurs, but, but kind of the universal saboteur is, is what we call like the judge. So, and there are kind of three modalities to the judge there as part of this positive intelligence system. And I think what kind of really hijacks our minds is mainly the judge. So it's, it's judge of self. So once, once we get, once we level up in belts or stripes or whatever that may be, suddenly that judge of self kicks in, which says that, you know, like, oh, you know, you should be on a different plane now, you know, so you should now be 
you've you kind of crossed this imaginary boundary between blue and purple. So, you know, and overnight you should be, your judge kind of in your head is telling you what well, you should be like beating up these blue belts now, right? And and it doesn't work like that because, you know, it's just like 24 hours in time that, you know, one one day you're a blue belt, same as somebody else, and next day you will level up to a purple belt. And it doesn't just kind of, you know, necessarily change like that. And 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 I think the second modality is kind of judge of others as well, right? We start to judge other people like, well, you know, rightly or wrongly, it's just human nature. Like, well, you know, he's a blue belt now, I'm a purple belt, or he's a white belt, I'm a blue belt. Like, I, I'm i better than him. You know, I should be better than him. And then you start kind of putting that pressure on yourself. And, and, and what happens is that you start getting this anxiety, you start not, you start shutting down your game you start to feel like you regress. And that's where, and pretty quickly, I see that P, the imposter syndrome comes in. So I was teaching a private to somebody who, a new blue belt yesterday. And so exactly the same thing as you, I was gunning for my blue belt. As soon as I've got my blue belt, I feel like, and he got his blue belt four weeks ago. Like, I feel like my game has just regressed and I just wish I never got it now. And I think I think that's what it is. And to be honest with you, it, it's a strange thing because I, I've heard multiple jiu-jitsu coaches talk about this and i think it's absolutely true i think where martial arts is a bit different and it kind of plays into that corporate space a little bit as well right is yes. is is in the belt system and if we look at the corporate space you know the corporate space might be you know you are i don't know like a finance director and suddenly you get promoted to chief financial officer right like you've got an elevator title it's almost going from like white belt to blue belt or in that case more more likely brown belt to to black belt right like and i think i think in our sport or in the corporate world you get this title and suddenly it's people expect that there's like a magical transition where you suddenly attain new ability new athleticism or, or new skills whatever that may be and it doesn't necessarily work like that so you know just because um i'm a black belt now I'm a black belt. And, and yeah, frankly, I have had a lot of imposter syndrome as a black belt. I, I feel six years into my black belt, I'm only starting to feel now that, oh, I think I've kind of shored up some of the big gaps in my game. That I'm starting to feel a bit like a black belt. But, but as an example, like I'm, I'm 70, 71 kilos. I'm 39 years old. I'm a, I'm a black belt. If, if I go against a blue belt, a good blue belt, who's 110 kilos, 22 years old, super athletic, like chances are you know like he's he's got more physical advantages on his side he's got more movements for solutions he's stronger right and in any other sport if we were to play rugby as an example when like you know like um semi-pro rugby and you've got a 39 year old um dad out there playing against like a young more athletic larger 22 year old or even a 19 year old nobody you know everybody expects the 19 year old is gonna going to outperform the 39 year old you know even though the 39 year old's been playing longer and has got more experience you know that that's a that's a given e even in professional sports everyone's looking at the younger the younger generation like these are the guys are going to uh, who are the best in the business now right whereas because we have that belt system and i think it's the same thing in, in corporate world because we have that that title and that status sit, um, system i think it create it, it creates more of that imposter syndrome um so i think for me it's trying to disassociate the two things you know like yeah there's belts over here but i do believe that you know it's that quote i think from common was henzo you know that a belt is only two inches around your waist you know that's all it is you know um i think we need to disassociate ourselves from that and also kind of the reality of the situation as well um where you've got younger stronger fitter athletes out there you know and so so don't don't beat yourself up essentially you know that's kind of my my view on it I love that. What um, has, has that ever happened to you as a professor? Have you um, had one of your students come to you and comment on on their own sort of, you know, have you have you noticed that in your own students and in in your experience? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, I think, like, like I said, that, that I referenced that um, teaching a a, a, um, a blue belt. Uh, during a private lesson yesterday but yeah it happened with a couple of purple belts um who, who got there yeah who got promoted a, a few months ago and yeah within within three weeks you know you get that message like oh 
I, I just don't feel like I deserve this purple belt. I'd love to give it back. Like, and it's just that initial drop in performance, I think. And you know, it, but it is interesting. Some some people can't get over that, um, and some people just need a couple of weeks, and and then and then they're kind of back flying again. But but you know, I, I feel like almost without fail that everybody kind of experiences that. But it's interesting. I I do feel that the people who are more competition focused um, get less of that. Um, so, for instance, like I, I'm training with a couple of uh, brothers at the moment. Uh, they're blue belts, uh, but they're, they're pretty much one of them. A guy, John Jackson, he's, he's pretty much full time. Um, you know, he's training uh, most days of the week with uh, Owen O'Flanagan. So Owen O'Flanagan obviously did. Uh, he's a bit of a star, unsurprisingly, now in the UK scene because he's the first person to kind of get to ADCC semi-finals, male, male UK athlete. I should say that because Fionn, Fionn um, is obviously um, an ADCC champion and world champion, right? Um, but, um, but yeah, you know, like he's training full time and he, he just focused on wanting to do better in competition. He's not, he's not worried about wanting to get belts or anything like that. So, you know, I, I tend to find the people who are very, very competition focused, um, particularly in nogi um kind of get a bit less of that imposter syndrome in, in my experience i'd say what advice would you give them to help them overcome that yeah what, what advice i would give them is don't yeah don't necessarily listen to try and try to kind of um block out some of those negative voices um in your head because because that that's your judge of self you know and i know he's, I, i've been there you know it, it's that's the voice saying that oh you know you you're a blue belt you got tapped by that white belt you're trash you know why did they why did they give you why did your professors you know give you that belt you know your garbage your technique is poor that kind of uh, that kind of thing you know i, I think it, it's one of those principles right like as well like i tell people like um, they talk about it in um, neuro-linguistic programming separating the behavior from the self and and it's not i i apply it to not necessarily behavior but performance right so i think i kind of say that imposter syndrome in jiu-jitsu i think this is why it builds so much resilience if you're in it for a long time is that you're gonna have bad days you're gonna have bad days on the mat you're gonna have bad days in competition but like one bad performance doesn't make you a bad grappler right so i can have bad days on the mat where i get I'm like, oh god, I got squashed by that big blue belt, that purple belt. I felt slow today, but um, and I don't, I don't necessarily consider myself a good grappler, but that's that's just one bad day, you know. Like, and, and I think people get so hung up on that one percent, and they they suddenly forget about, you know, if we talk about it, um, you rather than judgment, like you look at it in terms of discernment, blameless discernment, and, and look at the whole, like evaluate it, like actually the last five weeks i've been on fire i had one bad day so if i if i look at that like i had the the two percent has been a bad day but the other 98 percent been brilliant you know and if you look at it that way and can reset then the next the next lesson you, you'll do well but if you kind of dwell on that two percent and think oh, i'm garbage i'm garbage you know it's a self-fulfilling prophecy you'll go into the next lesson and you will be bad because you're telling yourself that you know uh, but if you can kind of separate the self from the one-off performance, then that, that'd be the advice I, I, I would give people. Yeah, separate the self. So that, therefore, you're not attaching yourself to the outcome as such, and therefore you're not being disappointed because the expectation is not as so high. Uh, absolutely. I and and it's, it's a really good point because one of the saboteurs that um, I see, it particularly in salespeople, because they're very target-driven, but one of the big saboteurs, for salespeople, and I imagine it applies to jujitsu, uh, jujitsu folk as well. It, it's the hyperachiever, and that's the problem with the hyperachiever, right? So, they, when that saboteur hijacks the person, they start to link their sense of identity with their goal. And the problem with that is, as soon as there um, are any bumps in the road, like maybe like an injury, or maybe you have a couple of bad weeks, it starts to cause more and more anxiety in the person because their sense of identities at threat essentially you know if i if i can't beat this person then who am i you know like i attach like exactly like you said i attach myself to that 
and my identity to the fact that I'm a purple belt, the fact that I'm going gunning for these goals. And I think when you do that, as I say, it just causes a lot of anxiety and actually it um, starts to starts to diminish your performance um, in the longer term. But no, I, I, excellent point. Yeah. Gosh, yes, I find it so fascinating. And you you mentioned you brought it up, resilience, you know, being able to overcome these stories that we tell ourselves and be able to overcome those challenges builds that resilience. I wonder, and you know, you might agree to this that resilience is one of the biggest principles that we gain out of this beautiful sport that we share. Can you recall a time? where you had to call upon your your resilience and and how that impacted your say your your life on and off the mats yeah i think um i think injuries right so i've had i've had yeah quite a lot of injuries um uh, it that's i think that's another thing that you know as part of resilience you have to accept when you when you do this sport that you know like injuries are an inevitability and that's something that you can't control, right? For for the best will in the world, but but injuries, I would say, certainly, um, I it kind of has a the best example, I would say, of having to kind of um, demonstrate resilience. So I, I tore my meniscus. Uh, the first bad injury I had was tearing my meniscus in in my right knee. I think my lateral meniscus in um, in two thousand and nine. Um, and all these injuries I've had are always like kind Ruby, of. Jay, Jay. Through BJJ, yeah, yeah. All, all injuries I've had have been through, like some people are like, oh, you know, you like leg locks and you've had knee injuries. They've never been from leg locks. They've always been from um, just being in weird positions, right? And like somebody sweeps you and you land funny. Yeah. But I remember I tore my meniscus in, in 2009 and that that kept me out because my knee kept locking and locking and locking. And um, there was, uh, it was deep in the meniscus. So the surgeon at the time said, look, I don't want to, I don't want to go in there and take out all your meniscus because you can have, it'll be 10 years and you can have bad arthritis. So, so I've still got a little bit of locking there, but I, I know how to unlock that, but it, but that kept me off a long time. And so I had to, um, yeah, I had to kind of accept that and kind of show resilience there. But I think, you know, uh, obviously most recently I, um, had, um, ACL reconstruction and also, uh, medial meniscus repair surgery in April last year. So I am almost eight, nine months post-surgery now. Um, but yeah, the first kind of four months, well, the first, you know, the first four months was not being able to do any jujitsu at all. So, you know, it's kind of having to show, and, and jujitsu is so important for my, like, my well-being. It's kind of having to show a lot of resilience there. And I think, you know, kind of the strategy that I used as part of that was, number one, knowing I was going to have need to have that surgery, um, just accepting that I'm going to have to let jujitsu go for at least sort of three months. Right. And, um, I think if I'd have continued like studying instructionals and, and that kind of thing throughout that throughout the first couple of months post-surgery, I think that would have driven me crazy. So it was kind of like, I can't do it. I'm just going to let this go and focus on other areas of my life, focus more on family and friendships and, and, and other things. Right. Um, and then as I started to kind of get recover a bit more, um, I think what was important to me was like getting back on the map as quickly as possible in some way, shape or form. So I'd say that about three and a half months post-surgery, like, and I could kind of sit on the floor at that point, cross my legs a little bit. That was kind of a, right. And I'm going to start getting back into some teaching, you know, showing what I can, um, and demonstrating and not sparring. Um, but for, for me, I think, yeah, resilience is all about bouncing back as, as quickly um, as possible but but I think I think at the start I mean I've read quite a lot of stuff on stoicism Ryan Holiday and that kind of thing and the obstacle is the way and but I, I think some of that stuff helped me as well like in terms of just just letting go of it at the start you know like this is the reality of the situation I can't train so why stress myself out about that um, accept it it's that acceptance and and then have a plan of action so so yeah I, I think Riz, everyone if you're in this game long enough I, I i for instance i don't know anybody who's done jiu-jitsu for more than 10 years and not had some sort of injury which has kept them off for some extended period of time you know like it, you just have to accept that that's going to be the, the case um and i think if you can accept that you can find strategies to 
to get around it. Yeah, I love that. I think you hit the nail on the head there, the acceptance. Accept that it's happened. What are we going to do to help overcome that? Absolutely. And 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 the fact is that you you can always bounce back and then come back, and which is what you've which is what you've done. So amazing. And and, um, and Frank, I'm sorry, just frankly about that. There's always gifts and opportunities in any situation. It's just can can you dig deep enough to mm -hmm. find them? So, as an example, like when I first um, tore my meniscus in 2009. Um, my game back then was kind of focused on like closed guard um which which is not which is not a suitable game for me you know i'm somebody who's five foot ten i've probably shrunk half an inch since then so probably more like five nine and a half now i've got i don't have long legs uh playing that sort of game was taxing right but when i tore my meniscus and came back it's kind of i found that if i closed my guard and people pushed on my knee to kind of open my knee would lock right so it's like i can't really play close guard so so the gift and opportunity in that was uh, okay i need to develop something else and um i developed more of a half guard game which has been more expansive for for my game like so as i say right now i can't play butterfly half guard because i don't i don't have quite have full flexion in my knee somebody puts pressure into my knee it causes a extreme amount of pain still at this moment so it's it's look again it opens up the game and the learning right like what other what other routes can i go down now how can i expand my game how can i learn a bit more zed guard so there's always gifts and opportunities um whether you you know if, if you kind of get injured and you have time out so it's just another way of looking at it i love that gifts and opportunities what are the gifts and opportunities in that experience i love yeah. it Beautiful. Now, empowerment is important in BJJ training. It's, and I'm, I'm sure you agree with that. Yeah. Now, I'm wondering how do you empower your students as um, as a leader to help them reach their full potential? Do you have, perhaps have a magic magic secret, or is there is there a secret way that you sort of help apply that? Oh, good question. So for me, I think I, I I I probably I probably consider myself to be a better instructor than I am a, an athlete in jujitsu, and I, I think it goes back to the start, right? Like I I'm just not a natural. Um, I've never been a natural at jujitsu, so I've always had to kind of um, self-direct, go out there, get more information, um, make things work for me, and I I think that. That kind of permeates into some of my in, instruction, uh, instructor kind of philosophy. Um, I'm not saying that I'm a I'm a great instructor, or anything, but but I, I the way that, one thing that I, is interesting to me is I, I've read quite a lot of books on um, and and studied um, sports coaching um, in elite sports, right? And I I do think that we are as a sport lagging behind um some of the other professional sports right and and the, the reason for that is i would say mainly due to investment um but it's interesting because when you look at the way that elite sports coaches go about their job it, it's very much about finding like mini like having little mini games that their athletes play which allow them to find their own movement solutions so i'm, I'm a big believer in like not one size fits all Right. So we've all got kind of different attributes, different uh, different strengths, like some of us are tall and long legged. And that's going to suit very nicely to triangles um, and that sort of game. Other people have shorter limbs and that's going to suit better for maybe a kind of butterfly guard type of uh, game, whatever that may be. Right. But I think it's important for as, as a coach to help people find their own movement solutions right um and and what's interesting somebody i think is really pushing the envelope in this space is um it's from your country kit dale um so so kit uh, kit dale's done a lot as i know as i understand has done a lot of study around this kind of stuff and, and i say like when so as an example when you look at let's say soccer or football right like one one example to help to help what coaches will do is like they might say 
okay, we're going to reduce the size of the pitch, right? And when I was playing soccer or football growing up, it's kind of like, you know, you can only you can only have two touches and then, you know, you've got to be past the ball. So it kind of starts to build more skills and, and more a- applicable in the moment, right? And and I, I think Kit Dale has recently, I haven't watched it, um, I, I need to get on it, but recently kind of um, released a, a DVD uh, or an instructional called um, Task-Based Games. So, you know, and it's very much about allowing students to find their own movement solutions and their preferences, right? So he, so for an example, it might be, I don't know, I haven't watched it, but it might be you've got a person passing and a person um, retaining guard. And the person on the bottom, their their um, their objective for the game might be, I want, I want that person to keep knee to elbow connection as long as possible. And the person on the top is, how do you kind of, break that knee to elbow connection so you can gain inside position so you know like that's the kind of thing where and it's not it's not something that, it's not the way that i teach just yet but i think that's where it's moving right because then you're really allowing the students to figure out this is the concept right the concept is the most important thing if you can understand two concepts and you and you get that you'll be able to find your own movement solutions it's also easier to remember that than have 15 different techniques from one position right um so I think that's the way that it's moving. But but for me, yeah, I, I try to very much instill concepts first and then kind of this is the way that I, I like to do it. And but as long as the student understands the underlying concept or, or the the deeper why, essentially, you know, it's more like Simon Sinek talks about the why. If we understand the why behind why we're doing something, then I think, you know, a the, the, the techniques I show will make more sense but also the, the student can find their own solutions as well. Mm, I love that. Finding your own movement solution. I really, really love that. Mm. And I'm, I feel like I'm at that level now where I'm starting to notice what game suits my own body type and my own movement. And obviously everybody has different range of movements, you know, some, yeah. of, some of us are flexible and some of them, you know, my pathological limit to um you know it's yeah adduction ab you know external rotation is very rigid <laughs> compared yeah. to say, somebody else so i'm now finding ways to modify techniques that is but that is more suitable to my own body type like or at least my own range yeah so i'm so glad you mentioned that because i've been feeling is this right should i really be pushing myself to really get those key components because I physically, physiologically struggle and then I feel bad about it. Yeah. <laughs> right? So I'm so glad you mentioned that um, because that's what you mean, right? It's like finding your own way of, of, of developing, I suppose, that technique. I mean, I love that you, the fact that you, you present the concept this is how I do it, you, you mentioned, and then it's up to the individual how they choose to interpret that technique. Yeah, so as an example, right? So as you're absolutely right. Like whether you're talking about, you know, your your the limits to your kind of shoulder flexibility, that kind of thing. Um, for example, like I think people might look at somebody who's like 71 kilos like me and, and you look at like the ADCC trials and that kind of thing and people of that size. Right, the, the, their games, the, the, the top athletes are highly mobile. Like they, they, they much pre- seem to prefer loose-based passing, right? Like Toriandos, that kind of thing. getting the opponent supine loose-based passing, right? Um, but yes, I'm, I'm similar size, right? But being 39, having had, I've got two bad knees now, um, and I've had back injuries and that kind of thing. I the move you know i don't really have access to those mo- those types of movement solutions i'm not as fast as i used to be right um and also like i, I want to manage my own injury risk so really for me now i focus more on tight passing you know because i can slow things down as a bit of an old older guy now even though i'm smaller slow things down look to pin people look to make sure that the other person can't use explosive movements on me because if they can that that increases my injury risk right so so for me that's kind of that's kind of where concepts come in into play as well you know like do you want to 
go for tight based passing and the concept about why do we do that we do that because we can slow things down or do we want to go loose based passing because you might want to be more mobile and you know attack in a in a faster way so when you kind of understand those things as i say you can start to develop it's also easier to develop your own game your own roadmap Mm, I love that. Thank you, Chris. That's really, you've explained that so well, and I don't feel so bad now. <laughs> Can I just pause two seconds to just put my uh, my charger in? If that's all right, my my laptop is started by two seconds. Sorry, sorry, Shane. Thank you so much for that, Chris. So the, the I have another question for you, sure. and that question is: What advice could you give, say, someone who finds the commitment and dedication required to train who they find it really challenging or extremely difficult what advice would you give someone who experiences some some challenges yeah um i think it's it's just so firstly do what you can um and i can relate to this because as part of the reason i would say i kind of got out of the corporate space um at the start of 2022, I found that between 2018 and 2022, um, I, I would say I was only training at best two times a week. Um, and in most cases, once a week and, and during, and, and that once a week I was training, I was teaching as well. So there was no opportunity to kind of develop my own game. Right. But, But I was just, um, and that was due to professional, commitments right so like in 2018 i had an international sales job so i was like on a plane most weeks um staying away in like southeast asia that kind of thing um so you but but you just do what you can right i think as long as you do what you can you're not losing momentum but the other thing i think it quite it, it kind of relates a bit to what we talked about regarding imposter syndrome right um in the sense that I, I, what I would say is readjust your expectations as well. Um, so the key thing I think in that, so like, like you, let's say you've got like four kids and you've got a demanding job, high powered corporate job and, and the rest of it. Right. Um, and, and you know, you've got to take your kids to all sorts of sports practices, school evenings, that kind of thing. You might only get the opportunity. You might, let's, let's say you might, you might have trained for a while. You're a purple belt as an example, right? So like high level guy uh, or girl. Um, but, you, but, but now you're down to training once a week, right? Like what I mean in terms of reset your expectations is at that point, you can't compare yourself to the people who are training five, six days a week, right? Um, it's, it's a, I think it's a quote from Theodore Roosevelt, right? Like comparison is a thief of joy. If you keep, comp- and this is what people say is kind of the downsides of social media. If you keep comparing yourself to those people, then then you, you you just you're you're never going to enjoy your training right you have to kind of reset your expectations at that point i would say and um i say a, a purple belt who's a fam you know um, uh, a full-time mother as well or a full-time father um is not the same even as like you know a low blue belt or a high white belt who's very much competition focused and training full-time five six days a week. they're not the same animals right so i i, I think just folk my advice would be just focus on becoming a better version of yourself right i think that's the main thing and that's kind of where i've, I've been on my jiu-jitsu journey like um as long as you feel more better like whether that's kind of the knowledge that you've gained um than than that version of you a couple of months ago or even a, a couple of days ago then, then you're making you're making the right progress, and you know. Th- then there's going to be a, t- a, a there's going to be it's ebbs and flow. It ebbs and flows, right? There's going to be a time when your schedule is less busy and you get to train more, and then you know, eh, it, it's, there's a Chris um, Howter uh, quote out there which I really believe is kind of like it's not about who's good, it's about who's left, right? And you know, when you've been in it for almost eighteen years now, like me, honestly, there've been some some really super talented individuals who I've seen over the years and they don't train anymore, you know, like whether that's injury, whether that's life got in the way and that that's, that's not wrong. That, that, that's, that's all good. Right. But, but, you know, it's kind of, as they say, you know, even if you look at the guys back then and they used to kick my ass, you know, like, um, that 
they couldn't now right you know what i mean so it's kind of that that's yeah that, that's the most important thing i would say you know kind of focus on on yourself and being at that a better version of yourself that's i love that beautiful. and resetting your expectations beautiful yeah, absolutely beautiful uh, i wonder if you can share a specific instance where lessons that you've learned in jiu-jitsu directly impact your leadership decisions or interactions Ooh. I think it's I think it's the same the same principle, right? Um in terms of letting people find their own way. Um and I, I, I think that you know in my in my in my corporate career, like the 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 managers who've kind of stood out most to me are the managers who gave me that autonomy why well, they empowered me to do it right and i've had i've had people i've had managers who are real micro managers and I, I i'm a firm believer that you learn from everyone right so even like earlier in my career when i had people who really micro managed me i think you learn you get you get benefits out of that you're like okay like i have to be more fastidious i have to be um more detail focused what you know what not um but also i learned from that that's kind of not the style the leadership style that i want you know to kind of put out there when i have a team um but i i think for me you know that that's the the main thing um and kind of how i try to apply it to whether and actually you know like as a parent now that's kind of that's leadership as well right like uh, my, my daughter is not quite at that age yet but she she's at a demanding age where um she, approaching the terrible twos right but i i think when i when i look at hopefully my parenting style growing up it, as she grows up it's the same thing like trying to get her to be able to self-direct i think and you know it, i think that's why it's important to me when i teach so i study a lot of instructionals you know like the danaher stuff there's amazing content out there you know that i didn't that wasn't available sort of i would say between 2010 to two i, I would say the turning point for me was around 2011 2012 I, I really felt that instruction all started to get better at that point but but you know that's why for me like i'm always if i teach or i show something i look i'm a big believer in like referencing right like so this is something i saw that gordon teaches or ryan hall or john danaher or Eddie come well whoever it may be right because at least I, I think if you reference it that way the person can go to the source right you know it's always you know whatever I'm showing is going to be second hand right like if you go to the source it, it, it's going to be you're going to get more from it so I think I think that's the key thing like as as whether it's like jiu-jitsu whether it's business leaders I think what we we want to do is empower people to be more self-directed that that's what i think because I, I i truly believe that a lot and in my personal experience but working with other people I, I i think people leave businesses and their corporate roles not not necessarily because of money but it, 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 i think a lot of the times when they feel like they can't drive their personal professional development anymore they, they can't they can no longer self-direct you know so so yeah that's kind of where i'd say i apply some of the principles in jiu-jitsu to professional and personal life i love that i love that letting people find their own way and allowing them to be self-directed beautiful now both bjj and leadership as you will know involve adaptability yeah, <laughs> how true. do you see this skill playing in both contexts in both leadership and in jiu-jitsu yeah i think um it's, it's interesting right one of the <clears throat> excuse me <clears throat> one of the most interesting books i've i've read um in the last 12 months is a book by you you may have read it um it's called the subtle art of not giving a fuck by mark manson and a great book um some people may find it polarizing but i i think one of the concepts that i i, I really took to heart from that was we are we're never right we're only a little bit less wrong right so I, I think it's something that again like applies so fits so nicely with 
jujitsu, but leadership. And so the way that I look about that, look at that is let's take jujitsu as an example, right? So like if you look at the the kind of leg lock meta and the no gi meta, right? It really started. Everybody talks about Danaher's guys, Gary Tone and Eddie Cummings, like those guys, Gordon Ryan you know, pushing the envelope back then. But the stuff that works in the initial kind of Eddie Bravo, no, Eddie, Eddie Bravo, Eddie Bravo Invitationals back in 2016, right? Like everybody looked at that stuff at, at the time, so like, wow, you know, incredible. This is this is the way we do it. But fast forward what is eight years now, like nobody kind of uses that stuff anymore. Like that stuff is, it's not wrong, but is certainly less effective than what we use now. And if you try and in high level competition, use the stuff they were using back then in high level competition now, or even in some good hobbyist gyms, it, it doesn't work or it, it, it's nowhere near as effective. Right. So I, I think kind of like you're always on a journey to, and, and the reason for this is because, particularly in jujitsu, which is human chess, people re start to react to things differently and figure out ways to counter and recounter. You never, you're always trying to figure out ways of being less and less wrong, right? There's no like kind of, and that's what I love about jujitsu: no universal right or no universal kind of truth in terms of the technique or or, the, or a certain position or a meta, right? And um, I think that's the same the same thing with, with leadership, right? I, I, and you know, being perfectly candid, I think one of the one of the, the areas I kind of struggled at, I would say, um, towards the end of my corporate career and, and, and leadership was just getting a bit left behind with some of the technical systems. Um, you know, like my my Excel skills weren't sharp enough, um, and and yeah, you know, like if you if you ignore that. So, like certain areas like that or you're not kind of evolving as things go go along you you just get left behind right so so i think ad adaptability is key and and it applies to um to to gyms and instructors as well right like we're in a, an age now where your students can go on bjj fanatics and as long as they've got deep enough pockets can buy every instructional out there right and it's not necessarily the case that as an instructor i feel like you need to know everything out there but you know like i think kind of keeping on top of trying to keep on top or be aware of the 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 current metas yeah where the where the kind of jujitsu is heading it from a commercial standpoint you know it, it keeps it fresh and it keeps your students wanting to to come back into the gym you know otherwise you know like they'll go somewhere else potentially where, uh, where another gym which is adapting which is more progressive right so yeah that's kind of my view on it Mm, no, I love it. That's beautiful. Um, now I'm going to ask you some rapid fire questions. Sure. Okay. So, so bear with me. Rapid Go fire questions to get a little bit more uh, taste of what what Chris is all about. Sure. Okay. Favorite food? Spaghetti bolognese. Yeah. Favorite quote. Favorite quote is whether you think you can or whether you think you can't, you're right by Henry Ford. Nice. Most memorable advice you've been given. Ooh. Most memorable advice is true. Trust your gut, I'd say. Mm -hmm. So if something, yeah, it was an, it was an old, old manager, I think he said, you know, like, it's the kind of does it feel right test, you know, when we were kind of going through certain negotiations with customers, does it feel right? If it, if it doesn't feel right, then let's not go for it. And I, yeah, I think absolutely that, that has been great advice. Love it. What advice would you give your 60-year-old self? In the future, oh, I'd say continue to adhere to your top three values. My top three values are freedom, health, and fitness, and family. So, just stick to those things, and hopefully, you can't you can't go too far wrong. 
Okay, there's an apocalypse coming. Yep. And there is only three items that you can take with you. What are those three items? Oh, yeah. three items. A zombie apocalypse. God, that's a that's, that's a crazy question. I mean, I, it'd have to be one of them would have to be my phone. Um but then but then I'd need a charger, wouldn't I? So <laughs> So that's kind of two items. Do you know what? I got this. I got this Casio G Shock. Um, I, I wanted the G Shock for inexpensive watch, but a G Shock is the toughest watch out there. So I'd probably say instead of a phone, I'd, I'd take. I'd, I'd say to take this G Shock because it's got the. Uh, it's solar powered, so right. So it's kind of um, always got energy. So yeah, a watch would be one thing. Uh God, that is that is a that is a tough question. A watch, something warm to wear, a warm coat, and some sort of weapon. Although I'm not, I I, I do jujitsu. I'm not weapons trained, but yeah, some some sort of weapon. What say. about your your artwork? Uh, no, I think I think I think there be there there would be ways to kind of. Uh, There'd be creative outlets, I would say, even in the the zombie apocalypse. That, that, that's that'd be that'd be my thought. But uh, survival is key, right? Survival is key. It's like, it's like, have you seen that film Zombie Land? Yeah. No, uh, no. no, no. It's it's a, it's a it's a comedy film, but um, I think it's, like they say, rule one is cardio. You know, that's that's the most important thing um, in, in the zombie apocalypse. So, so yeah, I'd, I'd say those probably those three things. Yeah. All right. And now, I, I say me, something warm because I'm just not a practical guy. I wouldn't I wouldn't have a clue about how to make a fire or anything. I'm so my wife is more practical than me. So yeah. so good. Now coming back to this amazing artwork, can we talk a little bit about this and how you know what inspired you to become an artist? I mean, I'm fl flicking through Instagram now and all your beautiful, amazing animations and all your um cartoons. How did you get to get to do you know come up with all this stuff like did you just decide that you will draw and somehow weave in jiu-jitsu related material in there like how did it how did it, how was it born yeah it's an interesting one because um i like for me like i've i admit to anybody i've never been natural at jiu-jitsu but um and I, don't, I don't necessarily look at myself as a as a great artist from a fine art point of view but naturally i've always just been able to draw what i want to draw and obviously i've always kind of if you look at pop culture and um television and, and you know i loved cartoons growing up that kind of thing um yeah I, i've just always so you know i did i did i did art at school um I've just always been able and i it's interesting i can't can't imagine that i i don't think i could teach like so i can say so i can instruct jujitsu uh, and they say like with jiu-jitsu like often the best competitors are not the best instructors because they can just do right like i don't think i could really teach people how to draw because i've always been able to just do it um but but it's one of those things i i, I think it was around 20 2015 2016 um i just had like a couple of ideas in my head that from you know like like certain cartoon characters doing jiu-jitsu and i had them i had them in my head for a while and um i to be honest with you i'd never engaged with instagram at all until until 2015 um just never had was particularly interested in social media presence in that sense like yes facebook for connecting people but um but yeah i, I had a couple of ideas like spider-man spider guard one um and a few other bits and pieces and and it was that uh the drawing of um, leonardo da vinci's kind of vitruvian man you know with kind of the uh, the circle and and like the, the proportions and that kind of thing i i I'd had that in my head for years like, oh, i think it looks so cool like i would wear something like that if it was on the t-shirt right and um and uh i i started um to learn a little bit about um some digital art programs and um just started putting some stuff out on instagram and um you know hashtags and stuff like that and and it was the the leonardo da vinci drawing in particular which went viral and then without my knowledge i think back then like nobody was kind of tagging me so you know like suddenly overnight like, i put this drawing out there and i'm like god like all these big 
accounts are reposting it and thousands and thousands of tens of thousands of likes and it was a bit annoying at the time because i had about like 40 followers on my instagram and nobody was crediting me um <laughs> but i think at that, at that point i was like oh, okay some people like those ideas yeah. and they seem to make people happy so so i just kind of kept kept drawing and um and yeah for me i think initially like if you tell me to sit down and paint like i find that boring a bit arduous but kind of so my process is draw by hand so sketch ink it by hand then take a photo of it on my phone uh, export it into a digital coloring program and then and color it and then kind of uh, render it from there so so that's kind of where i went with it and it's kind of like um it's a bit like jujitsu right i took a little bit of a break from it recently whilst i've been focusing on mental fitness um coaching and that kind of stuff but it's um yeah, there's always like new things in pop culture, new programs, new cartoons, and that inspire you to like, oh, yeah, I, I could do a drawing on this and and that kind of thing. So, so yeah, that's that's kind of where it came from, and uh, yes, yeah, so it's a it's a good. Um, I enjoy it. It's a good like outlet to. I love it. Stress. I love it. It's there's so much color. There's just so many different personalities. I'm just um, yeah, super impressed by your by your imagination and your ability just to come up with these ideas. You're a natural. Oh, well, really. follow, followers give me though give me some ideas as well these days, so it, it's quite cool. You get a message like this would be a good idea, and yeah, so it's, it's great. So good. One last rapid fire question, and that is, sure. what is your favorite song? Oh. God, favorite song. <laughs> this one always gets such a tough question. Do you know what? It's like my favorite song growing up, and I still like it now, so I'll put it put it in that category is uh Stan by Eminem. Mm -hmm. Never get bored of that song. Um, can you sing? Can I sing? Can you sing it? Stan, I, well, it's, it's a rap, I guess. Um, Can you rap it? <laughs> oh, but the, the Dido part, yeah. Um, my tea's gone cold, I'm wondering why I got out of bed at all. Morning rain clouds up my window and I can't see at all. Yeah, so I love it. There's, there's a rap to that as well, right? But, um, but yeah, I'd say that's kind of probably, I'd have to put that there, yeah. So good. So, so good. Now, before I let you go, Chris, is there any last words of wisdom that you wish to share? Perhaps any other further lessons that you wish to share that you want to spread out to the world? Um, yeah, with, so with regards to jujitsu, um, I, I think it is just, you know, people say this and it sounds cliche, but, you, you know, your journey is your journey don't compare it to anyone else and just just focus on being a better version of yourself um every day on the map right um and and just continuous continuous learning um i would say this again there's compared to when i started in 2006 there's just yeah you don't even need to buy instructionals the youtube you can there's so much resource on youtube and i think if you can yeah that that will just keep refreshing your jujitsu making it super interesting and that will keep you on the path and uh, yeah that would just just be it from from me but but no thank you so much for inviting me on on to the uh the podcast really enjoyed it so my absolute you. pleasure thank you for your time chris i love your 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 amazing wisdom reset your expectation letting people find their own ways having them find their self-directed ways and the lessons pick out the gift and the opportunities out of those lessons and own management solutions you've come up with just some beautiful ways of explaining your journey from mat to mastery it's been an absolute honor and pleasure having you share your experience thank you very much thank you thank you thank you thanks so much Chef. Thank you. And thank you all for watching and thank you for listening. If you want to learn more about what Chris does, I'll put down the website under the comment section. Feel free to reach out if you have any further questions uh, if, 
or if you want to just share his um, amazing artwork, it's, uh, you will not be disappointed. You'd be super inspired. Thank you for very much again for watching, and I hope to catch you all next time on the Matt to Mastery podcast. Thank you once again, Chris. Thank you, Chef.